designed kind of an a, uh, audience participation introduction for Nolan, and so I'm going to need your help here. Naturally, when we were looking for a keynote speaker for this for this first U.S. Go Symposium, we thought of Nolan. Why, you might ask. <laughs> Why? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, he's a Go player. Good. So what? <laughs> so am I. So what? You might think. Um, well, he named his company Atari. That's good. <laughs> Woo! What? I was going to cue you, but it looks like I don't need to cue you what to do. <laughs> You're just going to do it, so we'll go. Um, when he he com he designed the first um, commercially success uh, successful computer game, Pong. <laughs> Who's played this game besides me? How many people can say, uh, yeah, Steve Jobs, he worked for me. He was a bench tech for me. I paid him $5 an hour. <laughs> Not many. Um, let's see. So um, Nolan also started a, co a, a company uh, called Chuck E. Cheese. D does anybody know why he, Nolan liked the name Chuck E. Cheese? When you say Chuck E. Cheese, you have to smile. Woo! Try it out, Chuck E. Cheese. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, at the moment, Nolan is in the process of writing a book. Um, he's very, very interested in issues around aging and keeping your mind um, active and alert. Um, he's passionate about education reform. Uh, actually, education revolution, I think, would be more appropriate, uh, using the modern technologies. Um, he's, in my view, a transformational, uh, transformational thinker. And by that, I mean a person who can take a dream and put it out and make it become true in the real world. I think I can speak for all of us when I say our dream is that millions and millions of Americans will play and enjoy Go just like we do. And um, I'm hoping that Nolan will use his creative mind to wrap around that challenge and help us make that a reality. Can we have a really, really warm welcome for Nolan Bushnell? Isn't, I got I to gotta get close to this thing. Isn't Go a great game? Yeah. You know, it's awesome. It's multidimensional. It uses both sides of your brain. So, you know, what other game has it like that? Nothing. We believe, and I am sure, that if everyone in the world played Go, the world would be a better place. And you know, let's face it. You need a little bit of humility to play a good game of go. That's really hard for Americans. <laughs> you need a lot of patience. That's really hard for Americans. I think that uh, that we can fundamentally start to move in this direction because the next big wave of what's going on in the world will be creativity. And I can show you all kinds of studies that show that playing Go increases your ability to think outside the box. Now, it's a square board, it's kind of like a box, and you, and you can't play off it very much, but still, it works. I thought I'd start a little bit by talking about 
a little bit about the history of the video games. Let's see, I don't have my clicker with me. Oh, click it and maybe you can run it up. I'm <coughs> sorry, I left it on, my, on the, the keyboard back there. Anyway, um, history, the early history of the video games, next slide. And I worked at an amusement park when I was going to college. And I ended up being pretty good at it and ended up running the arcades as well as throw the balls, knock the milk bottles, guess your age weight. I'm with Carney. <laughs> and, uh, but I also played chess for the university. And on the chess team, there was a guy came called Mike Kim. I think that wasn't his actual name, but Mike seemed to work for everybody. One day I was in the lab, or in the, uh, in the university library, looking to work on my chess game a little bit. And I came across this book called Go. I looked at it and I read the rules and I said, this seems pretty simple but kind of interesting. What's going on here? And I went to, a, to the class, or to the, the, uh, the Go club, or the chess club, and I said, anybody know anything about Go? And Mike said, yeah, I know about it. Let's play. I says, I have no clue. He says, don't worry, I'll teach you. And so that started my love affair. I was a uh, sophomore in college, and I never looked back. Um, let's fast, and then fast forward three years later, a good friend of mine that I was playing Go with said, let's go up to the university, they've got a new game. And it was Space War. And it was on a PDP-1. And uh, well, let's see, that's, this guy is a guy named Dr. Evans. And you know, when you think about computer design and video, there were basically three places in the world that you could play on a video screen. One was MIT, one was Stanford AI Lab, one was Champaign-Urbana in, uh, in Chicago, and the University of Utah. Which one doesn't belong? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> Excuse me. Well, it turns out, Dr. Evans, uh, see all that circuit board there? That's a graphic accelerator. it could do about quarter inch pixels. <laughs> Not too cool. I mean, literally your cell phone can do more than that whole refrigerator full of stuff. But anyway, Steve Russell did this thing called Space War, ran on a PDP-1, and it was rocket ship and flying saucer. I couldn't get enough of it. But you take a million dollar computer, divide 25 cents into it, and you say, yeah, it probably doesn't work. It's not commercial yet. This is what it looked like at the university. And this was the state of the amusement game business at that time. You basically had DC motors, gears, pistons, slide projectors. This was a composite slide image using slide projector technology. That was state of the art then. Relays. Yeah. This is what it looked like. Cool, huh? And there was a thing called computer fluids. There was no computer in there. It was a damn slideshow. <laughs> so then I decided I was going to do a game called Computer Space. And I started out working on a mini computer. And my idea was to basically connect a regular TV set, about 100 bucks. Oh. I should have mentioned those displays that you saw back in the previous things, those are 25,000 bucks a piece. So that didn't work. So I thought that my big innovation was to take, a, many computers were starting to get cheap. My innovation was to hook it up to a regular television set. Well, as you know, video television sets, they use up data like it's going out of style. And I kept running out of time. Couldn't get the computers. I mean, it was going at a blistering 800 kilohertz. And uh, 
you know, you'd almost burn your fingers it was going so fast. Um, and so the, um, I figured out how to do it, and, but I kept running out of time. And so I started putting more and more into hardware. And I still ran out of time, and so I, I stopped the pro I said, okay, time's not right. Two days later, I had the epiphany. Throw away the mini computer. Do it all in hardware. So the early video games were not von Neumann architecture at all. They didn't run software. It was like a great big solid state signal generator. I mean, if you wanted to put in a digit of score, you had to put in four, four flip-flops and a decoder. I mean, that was, that was how it was. And those, the synchronous patents, which we, we got, basically lasted the coin op to the business all the way through 1977, 78. Remember, the microprocessor hadn't been invented yet. 1974, 4-bit micro from Intel. It wasn't until uh, 60 or, or 75 that we had something like the 8080, 86. And then we had this thing called the 6502, which drove all the apples. Did you ever wonder why a 6502 was in the Apple II? It's because Steve stole the parts from Atari. But that's okay. We actually had this thing where we were buying them for like eight bucks at the time, and they were 50 bucks on the, on the market. And um, which gives me a story where I say, you really shouldn't listen to anything I say here because I turned down a third of Apple computer for $50,000. <laughs> I regret that. Okay, this, then we did Pong, and, and you know, computer space, though it was really cool, it, all my friends liked it, but all my friends were engineers. It was, uh, it was way over the head of somebody with a beer in their hand. And so we did Pong, and these are my, my partner on the left, this is the guy who ended up stealing money from us, and this was Al. <laughs> Incidentally. The girl in the brochure before, she was the topless dancer at the bar down the street. Anyway, <laughs> Magnavox for the home did, did this one. And then we did the consumer pong in 85 that used the same technology. Step through here a little bit. Then we did the Atari 2600. These are a lot of the other Atari games that you all knew and loved. Then we did Chuck E. Cheese, Tempest, my favorite game. a vector graphic display that was multicolor. Now that's really cool, and it was technically really, really hard. But anyway, then I did a toy company, did a microwave company. I, I, mine, a, a friend of mine and I did uh, automobile navigation. Uh, you have TomTom Tom right now, it's sold a couple of times, but all our fundamental patents and databases were all based on this. this is the first automobile navigation system in the world. And then I did robots and I lost a whole bunch of money. Um, well, do you know what happened? They, I couldn't make the computers robust enough. They'd, the little guys would roll around and pick up static electricity and then it'd charge, discharge across the wheels and it'd go off in the, way, in the, the weeds. We would affectionately call that the mow the baby mode. Because if you were going full blast, 45 degree, 45 pounds, no collision detection, it's a dangerous missile. Uh, anyway, bad idea, too soon. My video, this was Amazon, but not successful. Um, but anyway, lightning strikes, things happen, and you move on. It's kind of like losing a game of Go 
you set them up again and you go for it. And that's really what business is all about. I might tell you that uh, Go actually was responsible back, and, and I, I was going to tell this story, and then I got going along with the train, train, train of consciousness. But I was playing Go with a guy. Stanford had a, uh, a Go club. Met on Thursday nights, and we'd go and, and play. And I was playing a guy there, and we got talking about computers and, and games and things like that. He says, have you ever played Space War? I says, have I ever played Space War? I love it. He says, hey, I work at the AI lab. And this, this is after I'd graduated and waited and everything. And so we went up, played until 5, 6 in the morning. And, and it was really the next day that the mini computer came across my desk and I said, aha, this is probably the time. So Go started it. Go re-engendered it. Go has been really important for me. I'm currently working on things called Brain Rush, and here's the problem. This is an actual study, and notice that 20 minutes in, only 20, only 20 minutes in, only 20 percent of any classroom is any kid paying attention. <laughs> Does anybody not believe that? It sounds high. So, so since we're about 20 minutes in, I think most of you are, are, are checking your email. I don't know. I'm actually, you know, this is the time I'm supposed to tell a joke. Um, just, to, just make sure that you're alive and, and awake. But my wife told me that I couldn't tell any of the jokes that I usually tell. <laughs> this is a Christian. This is a Christian facility. So anyway, uh, let me tell you what we're doing with, with learning right now. Learning, don't, I didn't say anything about teaching. What do we know about learning? How do you learn? Well, it turns out that if you were to design a program that is as bad for learning as you possibly could, it would be the classroom. Now think about it. There's a thing called thalmic engagement. There's a thing called space repetition. There's a thing called everybody is different. Everybody learns in a different style, in a different speed. So here's a great idea. Let's put everybody together. Let's not do any spaced repetition. Let's not do any thalmic engagement. And let's not do, and let's force everybody to learn the same way at the same speed. We got that one, and it's not working. So what you do is, this is what's happening today. Presentation, homework, presentation, homework, test on Friday. What we think is you mash that all together, and you call it play. And what you do is there is no presentation mode. There's no the homework mode. It's simply. You start taking the test. And you say, well, I don't know what it is. They say, that's OK. The reason is it turns out that a wrong answer is instructive. And so we force a response every six seconds. And by doing that, you're lighting up your brain like it's a Christmas tree. If you put an MRI on somebody watching a lesson, watching a movie, reading a book, there's no activity in the, in, in the upper reaches of your brain. Zero. Nobody home. The minute you ask them a question, all of a sudden you're lit up like a Christmas tree. It's called thalamic engagement. And anything that doesn't go through your thalamus, which is the seat of, of consciousness and activity, you are being inefficient. We are currently, let's see, where was it? Always acted rapid response, and adapts to students. That's what our software does, and it's three to five times faster. And that's my, my partner, who is a conservative. 
And I say it's five to ten times faster. But he says, but we haven't proven it. I said, yeah, we, we, we really have. He says, but not rigorously. Ah, eh, come on. Um, I'm a carny. Uh, anyway. And it gets faster over time. So we have spaced repetition algorithms that are getting better. We're in front of 50,000 kids. We, we did our, all our alpha tests on, uh, on Spanish language vocabulary. Kids who use our stuff end up with working vocabulary in Spanish one of 1,500 words. Kids who don't use our stuff have a, have a working vocabulary of 200 words. That's 10 times better, right? Or pretty close. <laughs> so it's, uh, we have a premium, it's supplemental, it's crowdsourced. That means our software is such that we're going to let everybody come in put in the lessons that they want, teachers, you know, I'm expecting everybody in this audience to do two lessons in the next year. I don't care what on. But you know something that you want to teach. And think of Wikipedia meets Zingit. We're giving it away. We're going to ask you all to give your time to do wonderful things. And we're going to change the world. Fundamentally, change the world. <laughs> now, let's see. Oh, that's out of place. Um, that's the thalamus. It's actually a cool slide, isn't it? We also get an inventory of your brain. Think how frightening that is. Um, We'll know exactly what you know, but more than that, we'll know what your rate of decay is. And it turns out everybody has a different rate of decay, and your rate of decay is different for different subjects. There's this thing called schema, and if you are learning things about something that you're passionate about, your decay rate is significantly less. But with spaced repetition, each repetition is longer in time. We believe that with as little as 15 minutes to an hour every month, you will be able to maintain 100% of everything that you've learned in high school and college for the rest of your life. You may not want to, but, <laughs> <laughs> but it'll be there. Oh, this, this, this is the MRI stuff that I was talking about. That's learning. If it's not lit up, you're not learning. It turns out that it's fun, creates enthusiasm. And I wanted to put this in. It's not quite germane. But it turns out that creativity is very interesting. There was a study done at, at Columbia University in the pottery department. And the pottery department, with the association with the, uh, the psychology department, said, we want to test creativity. And so the left-hand side of the class, they said, we want you to make one pot, but it's got to be a humdinger. The other side of the class, they said, all you have to do is make a whole bunch of pots. You're going to get an A if, w when we weigh your pots, they weigh the most. <laughs> okay? Everybody in the quarter, there was half of them that were just sweating over this uber perfect pot. The other guys were slinging clay and mud and having a ball. Guess where all the good pots came from? Which side of the class? The quantity side. And what it really talks about is that creativity is actually can be driven by freedom to experiment. Drop the risk and creativity really, really is wonderful. Go allows us with the right and the left hemisphere to every time we play a game, we engage a certain creative schema for our games. At least I do. You know, I lose sometimes because of it, but it seemed cool at the time. <laughs> and I believe that 
that go integrated into regular curriculum gives this openness to creative thought that needs to be taught. Because the next wave, I mean, we know the college degrees are not worth what they used to be. We know that, you know, standing in plain sight is Steve Jobs, who dropped out of one semester at Reed College. Steve Wozniak, who never went to college until after he was a multi-hundred millionaire. Um, Michael Dell, Bill Gates, weren't college graduates. I would not have graduated from college, except, you know, well, there's a long story on that, but I actually graduated number 247th out of class of 247, <laughs> dead last. Now, you can look at that two ways. They can say, were you kind of a dummy? Well, no. I got the most efficient college education I could. I did not do one thing more than I had to <laughs> to graduate. So I think that's efficient. I don't know. So we need to be able to deal with creativity. And this isn't the way. And we need to understand about flow. If you haven't seen the TED talk, you can't, the guy who did the talk is called Mihai Chichimihai. It's all, there are no vowels in there. There's just a whole bunch of consonants. But you go, you look up flow, and he talks about keeping people engaged. And it's what we've been doing with video games all our lives is make them just hard enough that you can't do it, and just easy, or you can just barely do it, and, and easy enough that you can get by. It's called getting from level one to level two, but not every time. And if you can get into that element of flow, Chichimihai says it's as happy as you can get as a human being. Why not? get our kids in the state of flow, and that's what our software does. That's why you can take the most ADD kid in the world and put him in front of an a, uh, a video game and doesn't blink for two hours. ADD is very often misdiagnosed, and it's really BTS. Oh, you don't know what BTS is? Boring teacher syndrome. And anything you do, remember the old Hippocratic Oath. Intentions don't matter. It's outcomes that do. And the first thing you have to decide on moral action is to do no harm. What happens if I can teach people 10 times faster, but I end up teaching them the wrong stuff? I'm actually a little worried about that, but anyway. Thank you very much for your attention, and I'd love to answer any questions and riff for a few minutes, and uh, let's have a good time here. Well, we don't like you. Uh, be, <laughs> the, the history of, uh, of Tempest was that it was actually one of the early games that was actually a von Neumann architecture. It had to, uh, it, it, it had a very, very sophisticated program to it, and it had a vector monitor. And in the early days of even the microprocessor, we had to do all kinds of things to get the game so they could operate. And so the vector monitor was different in that you didn't have to keep up with the spot. You could basically draw the pictures as you could. And so it, it, it released a lot of the demand on the microprocessor. So. How long have you been playing Go when you decided to name your company Atari? About five years, something like that. Um, 
I actually named another, I had another company that I named Sente. I thought that was a good one, huh? And then, uh, not to be outdone, one of my friends named their uh, company Tengen. Uh, <laughs> so, and, and that really made me mad, because once, once he said that, and he did Tengen, uh, I thought, boy, I, I, I wish I'd have gotten that one. Um, I never wanted to name my company Gote. <laughs> I thought that would be kind of a problem. You know? <laughs> Well, let me be very clear. Oh, uh, what, what is the difference between what Brain Rush is doing and everybody else? And I'll make it real simple. Theirs is crap and ours is really good. Uh, <laughs> but that's the, that's the glib answer. Um, most of their, the other, it, it's about teaching, not really about learning. And unless you are forcing three to five second response, everybody else is wasting their time. So if you, if they're, if they're doing that forced response, uh, and there's only a couple that are sort of nibbling around the side of it, I've been starting to make a lot of noise about it, so, you know, everybody likes to copy, and that's okay. But, uh, but without the spaced algorithms, we, we've spent a lot of time on this algorithm. And I can tell you that nobody is within a half an order of magnitude of us. We're five times better than anybody else in outcomes. Uh, you know, we're really good, what can I say? <laughs> yeah. Have you visited your global uh, hacker spaces? What do you know about like, creative environments and learning environments like that? Is that what I You know, creative environments, that, that's actually, I'm, I'm writing a book right now. It's called Finding the Next Steve Jobs. You know, it's. I'm being a little bit, I'm the only guy there gave Jobs a job. And, uh, and so what I'm really talking about is a lot of the corporate culture that Atari had with all of their innovation and games and, and the other stuff, while I was running it, Warner kind of screwed a lot of it up. That's another story for another time. But Steve actually took a lot of that metric with him when he went to Apple. And it spread to a lot of the Silicon Valley companies. And so creativity right now is about managing risk. And there are a whole bunch of things that are really, I think Kickstarter is wonderful. The, the, the uh, you know, maker movement. Uh, and a lot of the, the creative labs that are available like you're talking about. It's, it's an explosion of creativity right now, and I think you, you haven't seen anything yet. I think the next five years are gonna blow your socks off. We're not going to be all things to all people. What, we, what we're doing is, we're, think of it as building platforms. And all, all levels of knowledge start with memorization of facts, rote memory, what have you. Think of that as just the platform in which you build other things. We, we're pretty sure we can not only teach facts, but we don't have working software on what I'd call some of the other nuanced things that what I'd call really good education gives you. And that's where teachers and professors still have a, have a place. But teaching, you know, junior high school kids anything in terms of, of you know, it's chaos, <laughs> you know. And, and what you really want to be able to do is is make it so that the teacher can have a virtual classroom of three to five. 30 doesn't work. And so the kids can be, you know, working on, on their 
computer-aided uh, stuff, and the teacher can be turning a lot of that base wisdom or base knowledge into wisdom. It's kind of the way we're looking at it, and creativity. Would I call it a game? I don't know. I mean, I really had the blessing in my life that I cannot tell my work from my play. And I think properly done, I want to create that same confusion. I don't want people to be able to tell when they're playing a game and when they're playing a school or, 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 or learning. I think learning should be every bit as engaging as Halo. Prob a lot less blood, though, <laughs> except in the pre-med, you know. Interesting you say that. Um, we have a fellow who is actually currently doing some modules on music and keyboard skills and, you know, clefts and, and, and what have you. Um, I think we, you can, we can clearly do art history and, and some of that and technique and, and that sort of thing. Um, we're actually got some plans on creative writing and a certain amount of creativity. I, you know, I don't think that I, I don't, this doesn't have to be all things to all people. It just fundamentally has to change the world, you know, <laughs> and uh, we've got to leave a little bit of something for other people to do. It's only fair. I think we should get out of here. I've held you enough and, uh, you know, Give me a ping every once in a while. I love Go players, and uh, I'm on KGS, sometimes anonymously. Uh, and I just learned that I can, in fact, have two accounts. <laughs> what? Oh, okay. Well, but what I need to do, and I realized that I had to do this, is that I have to have a two martini account and a, and a sober account. Because <laughs> every once in a while you, you have a, a drink or two and you want to go play a little game. And, uh, and boy, can I really be crappy. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Nolan Bushnell.